Hello and welcome, or welcome back to Read Becca. We're here for another weekly catch up on my reading, and I have a ton to talk about. And apparently, it's a long title week this week, so we are we're going to just jump right in. Uh, first, I finished. We had to remove this post, and it's a teeny tiny novella. Uh, it is a 2022 release, so good for a new release of on, even though it's not really speculative. Uh, this is very like contemporary set, and it's also a woman in translation. So this is written by. Hannah Bervo and translated by Emma Roll. Now, uh, this I was very trepidatious about the content because this is following uh, social media moderators and they do see some pretty horrific things. So I was worried about that. But this, the story of this is we're following a single character, Kaylee, who is I would say kind of kind of a like tradi traditional directionless millennial, <laughs> if you will. Uh, she just kind of goes along. So she has worked in previous like customer service type roles and dated people just because they were they were their co-workers and that, that kind of is what happens through this this novel but she broke up with her previous girlfriend and after that kind of fell apart she stopped everything in life and let her house get run down stopped working stopped stopped doing anything and so she has reached this desperation point where her house is falling apart, um, she has no money, can't afford food, and so she has to get a job. And she takes this, this job working as a contractor for the platform, and so takes this, this social media moderation role. And I don't want to say a ton about the plot because, I mean, there, there really isn't anything you could, you could spoil for this, I don't think. It's, it's mostly just following this this group of characters as they're all new hires together and learning what what they have to do it starts with this this interesting element of everyone always wants to find out what the most gruesome thing they have seen they don't care about their job they just want to know what's the really horrible stuff that you see and so from that very first bit, they're being dehumanized. Their, their experience and the things they're seeing are being disconnected from the reality that they, they experience. And that, we'll, we'll come back to that. That's, that's very key to this. That's the big theme to this. Um, so as this group are, are going along and we're seeing them go through training and learn how to deal with these gruesome things. Uh, and they are codified down to an act and how they have to moderate that act based on context, I would say. Um, so the more and more this, this group of characters who are friends, um, our, our character Kaylee starts dating another woman there, um, so we see their relationship from the inside. Um, as they are going through that, they begin to detach from the fact that these are, are like real things that are happening and that kind of causes them to detach their sense of reality in fact and i think that's that's the core of this so it's really smart how this is framed so first of all the writing from a prose standpoint there's nothing really special about the prose but the framing is that kaylee is writing a letter or, or something to i guess a lawyer who is maybe leading a um a class action lawsuit um, for these employees after the fact, after they, they've left, apparently. Um, so she's writing this letter, and there are par parts where, like, she's telling the story to, to this um, lawyer of her telling her therapist a story of something that happened at this job. And so that has a really good detaching effect for the reader. So you're getting detached from the reality of the situation at a very big remove at multiple steps removed. So I think that was really, really smart. Um, in terms of that, that framing, we're slowly getting snippets of the progression from that new hire to the end of the book. And the end of the book, like, I'm not going to like spoiler any of the content, but you should probably know going into this, the book just stops. It just stops literally in the middle of a scene. <laughs> And so there was a, a lot I saw after the fact of people being pissed off about that. <laughs> but getting closure is not the point of this book. Um, so going back to that central key element, I have to liken this a great deal to Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. I think this is dealing with the same themes and messaging to the reader, where 
in Earthlings, we have something up front. We have a discussion of the horrible things and the way that uh, society desensitizes us to horrible things. Um, so in Sayaka Murata's book, we have these really horrific things that happen in the beginning of the book that are somewhat like they're horrible, horrible things, but we're sort of socially normalized to them. And then you get to something at the end that's really rare and unusual and horrible. And everybody talks about and reacts to that thing at the end that is extremely unlikely to happen, right? But we've just been through all of this really extreme horrible stuff for the entire first half of the book. And people aren't as reactive to that. And so it's all about social desensitization, right? So, so that book is engaging with the same thing as this one here. And here we have these characters who it works for the reader as well. I think I can't imagine having translated this um, because I was worried about the content. And I will say there are maybe two or three things that are actually kind of described in a graphic way and really were like at my limit. But for the most part, most of this, it is down to a, a single word or, or phrase description of an act. And then the context is like, uh, is this, it's this act, is it a picture, is it a video, is this exposed, like it's a sex act, is there exposed nipple, right? Um, is it a video, is it a photo? That's how codified down it is, so it didn't actually bother me for, for most of this. Um, so even though this has like loads of content warnings, every content warning I could give you, as I said there's only like two or three that are maybe a couple sentences that are actually described in ways that are horrible. Um, one in particular, the initial description is not bad, but then it gives you one piece of contextualizing information that makes it really horrible. And yeah, it's, it's so smartly executed. So for me, I think this is wrapping it up. For me, it's amazing how this really gets down to the distance of these characters of the way that they're the way that they're interacting with these situations that are videos of real people of real things happening and as they're desensitized to those they become more and more desensitized to reality and fact in their own lives and that takes a very weird turn as things progress on to the end of the book um which I don't want to spoil because it's a tiny little book. So yeah, it's it's really interesting how that's done. So for me, this was better. I liked it more in terms of that execution than I liked Earthlings. So that's going to be, I'm sure, a controversial opinion for, for some of you um, because this was very focused and concise about doing that. And I felt like Earthlings maybe went a couple of different directions and could have actually reined it in a little bit versus this was it knew exactly what it was trying to do and it kept it locked in to exactly that it didn't it didn't flail all over and try to deliver a lot of things so so yeah i i actually really like this it has all the content warnings definitely it's got some very gruesome stuff in here but i thought it was really phenomenally well done so that was interesting um very very interesting to be reading at the same time as I picked up an ebook, uh, Deadly Waters by Dot, Dot Hutchinson. Um, I basically just randomly picked this up because it happened to be downloaded on my phone already. <laughs> um, so if you have Prime, you get these Kindle first reads. You get a choice of a free book every month from like five or six books. So that's not gonna really stay. Um, so I randomly had this on my phone already. Um, I know Dot Hutchinson, uh, the Butterfly Garden maybe is really gruesome and like from a serial killer perspective um, with with very young girls and that sort of thing. So I knew this was going to probably be really gruesome and so I picked it up from maybe a, an off chance Garbaga Street. And this ended up not being garbage really. It was very graphic though. So it was really intriguing to be reading this at the same time as the other book because of that, because this one didn't phase me at all. This is way more descriptive about everything. This is extremely about sexual assault. Um, it's like literally the opening scene is somebody getting killed by alligator. Um, that's the premise here. Um, the story of this is basically the frat plotline from Veronica Mars, but 
with revenge. <laughs> so yeah, revenge by alligator, as I said, um, that's kind of the whole thing. There's some sort of serial killer killing rapists uh, at a, a university by feeding them to alligators. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a whole plot. Um, we are following a single character, oddly enough named Rebecca, and she's a journalism student. So she, you know, she kind of knows what to look for and what to pay attention to. She's got that really critical eye. And she's, you know, they're, they're heading toward finals pretty much as the, the first killing happens. And initially the cops kind of think, yeah, this is, this was just an accident. And then there's more and the cops are just like, wow, the, the, the alligators are just really overrunning the area. And eventually it becomes clear that these aren't accidental killings. We find out that the frat had a habit of kind of encouraging this. They had um, a board just like in Veronica Mars where they were keeping track of, of the women they were taking advantage of. And so this is this is very much, um, I, I think uh, it was maybe Fraser Simons who said uh, women killing men or hurting men who hurt women. Uh, so that that is really what this is. This is this is purely a like sexual assault revenge fantasy. And it's very graphic, as I said. So so both the the sexual assault elements are pretty horrific and the, the violence, like um, dismemberment, I would say, is a big part of this. Um, it's not as graphic as it could be. It, they're pretty rapid scenes, but, but it's very, it's very gruesome. And as I said, like nothing in this even phased me reading it compared to the other book where, you know, it's talking about how we become decent do these things. So because, you know, I'm so, I guess, exposed to this, like that it's just normalized. So I really enjoyed this. This was compulsively readable. I was reading it purely on my phone because I, as I said, I had it on um, my phone downloaded already. So I was reading it, you know, when I was walking my dog, but it was like flying by. I didn't want to put it down. So so I wound up reading it very quickly for, for being just a, a moment here and there. So I think the, the perspective was actually done really smartly. I don't think there's anything super special about the writing of this book. It's, it's a thriller, uh, I would say, but it doesn't really have the mystery elements. So we get chapters here and there throughout. Well, the chapters are basically the killings. Um, we get the, these chapters throughout that are from the killer's perspective. But at no point through this book is there actually like a real effort from our main character to figure out who the murderer is. And so it's very, very curious because we only really have like three main named women characters. So we know it's either one of these primary characters or it's some random person. And that's, that's very interesting because the book is really strongly pushing us toward one character. The, the kind of everybody word of mouth knows that it's this person and it's even in the synopsis. So, so it's not a spoiler for me to tell you that like everybody knows and is talking about it. She's very brash. She's very um, outspoken about thinking these guys deserved it and joking about them dying and, and that more people should be dying for this. Um, even with the cops, like she, she does not hide it at all. Um, so, so it's got an interesting framing in that like it's not a murder mystery. It's a it's a thriller for sure. But this this character, who's the journalist, is more interested in kind of uncovering what's going on, like the pervasive rape culture at the university, rather than uncovering who's actually doing the murders. So that was really really interesting way of of looking at it. But in terms of the book, it was it was a fine book. It was very compulsively readable. It wasn't anything like super duper special though. I do think I would like to read more Dot, Dot, Dot Hutchinson though, because like everybody who's really into very dark thrillery stuff um, really likes kind of her, her other serial killer series. So, so I would definitely read that. But so with that, that framing and these two books that I've talked about already and the, the normalization of horrible things, that was so like hammered home for me because I picked up, I kind of randomly picked up a brand new release that's self-published. It's supposed to be really, really feel goody. Um, and I won't talk about it here because I have too much to talk about. I will talk about it later once I've actually read it, but literally the title is Fluff. It's supposed to be very feel good. And the first scene is a girl starting at university and her having that thought that girls on campus are sexually assaulted in this just total meant to be feel good book. And it's just barely mentioned, like it's, it's a passing thought, you know, like it's just normalized. 
And that's how normally that has become. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. So I had a lot of big thoughts about that <laughs> this week about the normalization of horrible stuff. Um, but I think, I think that's it for those. <laughs> I think we got there. So next I read You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty by Akwaiki Messi and uh, narrated by Bonnie Turpin because I did the audio. Bonnie Turpin is amazing, amazing audio narrator. You can pretty much rely on anything she has narrated to be, to be great. So very much enjoyed that even though this is a spicy romance novel. Uh, it definitely has some steamy scenes, including right at the beginning. So, so the plot here is that Fei Yi, our main character, and this does only have a single perspective. It is not alternating perspectives. Uh, she is grieving. She's a widow. Her husband, uh, who she married very young, died in an accident and she survived. And it's five years later, she is still grieving and trying to get over this. And she decides in the opening scene, she's going to have sex with someone for the first time since. And so she, she hooks up with a stranger that she meets at a bar. She takes him to the bathroom basically and, and does it. Um, yeah, so, so it, it starts off like that, um, but it does not stay like that. So as a result, they kind of become friends with benefits, I guess. And she then is connected into his friend group. And, and there's no drama surrounding that, which I really liked. Uh, she like they are they are genuinely just friends with benefits. They don't don't try for more of a relationship, but she does connect with his friends and makes a connection with a rich guy, who, who then as I said is a genuine connection for her because she's an artist and she has she doesn't try to like take advantage of that in any way whatsoever, but he offers and it turns into her getting an art show on the islands, I, I guess Caribbean islands, I assume it doesn't specify what island, uh, a, a trip over there, um, stay at a mansion, uh, meeting a celebrity chef, like, it's just a whirlwind. So it, it has all of that wonderful, like, food and setting that really takes you away. So that's most of the novel is, it's her going to kind of explore this other world that she's never been exposed to and preparing an art show and continuing to process her grief. But during all of this, she is falling for someone she shouldn't be falling for. And that is what kind of lost me on this because probably you have maybe 10% at the beginning and then 80% of the book is her alternately going, oh man, I really like this guy but I can't, oh no, and catastrophizing herself about how horrible she is for, for feeling these things that she shouldn't be feeling, she thinks. And through this whole thing, I was like, you don't need to be in a relationship. You need therapy, like really hardcore therapy. And she really is not, clearly not ready for everything she's going through and processing. Um, so she felt like kind of a disaster, <laughs> um, was not, not great. And it was, it was angst. I didn't like the angst. I didn't like her beating herself up so much over this and kind of lying to herself about everything that's going on um, and doubting. And this person has to constantly reassure her. Um, so he is very steadfast in this and he is always like perpetually reassuring of her doubts about herself um, that if she really doesn't want to be in the relationship because she's trying to torpedo herself, uh, then he's going to be respectful of whatever her choice is. Like he is, he's great the whole time. And she is just back and forth. It's like one step forward, two steps back the whole friggin' way. So, so that was kind of miserable to read about in this, you know, what's supposed to be a, a romance. Um, so she clearly is not actually over her grief enough to be doing this. And what made me really not buy into it is that all of a sudden, in like the last 10%, she suddenly becomes super mature, super rational, and very respectful, um, and has, has boundaries about everything. And it's like, where did this come from? It did, didn't make any sense to the previous character that we saw. So I think what I have to say, like, in terms of, like, this was a, a good book. Um, it, I just didn't personally like those elements. The, the writing is the strength here, though. Like, Amezi writes with 
electricity. Like, their prose is amazing. Uh, the setting, I already told you, like, you're getting these great, great food and island descriptions that are just alive. Um, the characterization is, is really great, other than, like, feeling a little inconsistent about this character. Like, they feel like whole people. Um, they feel like there are rich relationships here. And I really adored Faye's relationship with her best friend, Joy. Like, they are a true, like, supportive, but with challenges, <laughs> supportive through all these problems, friendship. Like, they're true best friends. And so I loved to see that. But I just didn't really like the romance. Like, that was the main sticking point for me. I didn't actually want this character to be in a romance in the first place. Like, I wanted her to be processing her grief. So, so that was the main difficulty for me on this book. But I did really enjoy it, and I thought it was, as usual, and Messi is a really, really solid writer. Then we have my final book for the week that I finished is my Garbagest pick, And the Devil Will Drag You Under by Jack L. Chalker. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this very briefly because I think I'm gonna wrap up all my Garbagest books together. Um, so this one is an end of the world type scenario where oddly enough, it's very similar to Don't Look Up, the recent film, where like there's a, a meteorite that's gonna be completely harmless and, and not hurt anybody, but we figure out there's minerals that are super valuable on it. And so they send up some bombs to knock it out, of course, to try and get it in orbit around the Earth so they can harvest these minerals for money um, because we're greedy a-holes. <laughs> and uh, so in doing so, they set it directly on course to crash into Earth and kill everybody. So we have people who are sitting in a bar waiting for the end of the world, basically. And one of them is Asmodeus Mogart, who is not the devil, but a devil. And as it turns out, there are individual devils on every universe. Each universe is really just an experiment and the devils are there kind of overseeing it. Um, so in hopes of stopping all of this, he says, hey, these, these two other people that are there, Jill and Mac, if you guys can travel to these other universes and get me five jewels, these are jewels of power that each of the devils of the universe has. Uh, we might be able to stop this end of the world because I'll have enough power to do so. So <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Um, so so running quickly through quickly through the universes that they go to. Um, the first one is a very like religious and gender role specific world where sin is supernaturally enforced, and so you face immediate physical consequences if you sin. Um, the second one is uh, like a Neanderthal world where it's very hierarchical and uh, strength strength is power sort of world. Um, the next two are really just traditional fantasy. Um, one of them is like thieves and sorcerers type world and the other one is anything you imagine is real. And then the final world where the two people go together is like an urban fantasy. <laughs> kind of world where it's a contemporary setting in Chicago and there are like organized crime and cops are prominent but there's also paranormal elements vampires and uh ghosts that sort of thing so so they travel through all of these worlds to get the jewels to bring them back to Asmodeus Mogart in hopes of saving their world and um in each of these they they suffer many uh problems for sure um and there's consequential nudity as always happens in these nonsense books. So as far as the book goes, I had a real trouble rating this because it's a bad book. It's not very good, but it was very entertaining. Absolutely redonkulous, I would say, in terms of my rating scale, <laughs> absolute redonkulous. Uh, so I think it was like a two star in terms of quality of the book, but it was, it was very goofy and, and ridiculous. I did actually laugh out loud many times at how over the top certain things were. So so yeah, it was it did its purpose of being a trashy entertaining read. It was much too long, I think, and the, the framing of all of these worlds, like e each of these worlds, they spent way too much time in them. Like the last world they're there for weeks and in our world they're meant to only have a few hours. So there's no way they knew how long they had for the end of their universe and they're just keep going and hoping they get it done before they have to 
So that it, it lost the sense of tension of being racing against a clock, I think. And that's the main <laughs> proponent of this book. So it was it was ridiculous. Um, so that's all I finished. In terms of what I'm reading, I think, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm reading a fluffy book on ebook right now. That's not a big priority, but I, I think I will read it pretty quickly. Um, I am reading another Garb, Garb August book, Cowboy Fang's Space Bar and Grill by Stephen Bruce. And I'm still chipping away at Brickmakers by Asada Amada for Book Two Prize. And this I will certainly finish this weekend. It's it's pretty short, but it has been a little slow going because there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of graphic content in this. Imagine I'm I'm dealing with a lot a lot of graphic content this week. Um, so I think I think that's it for books. We made it <laughs> half an hour later. In terms of my week. Uh, it was very, very nice, like lovely 80s temperature wise and not humid. So it was really like easy to go outside and walk and read. Uh, really, really good to finally have after two months basically of extreme heat here. So that has been great for my mental health. Um, so I'm feeling like really good week this week. However, I did I did experience that like I need to read all the things, but not like by actually reading them, by like doing the mental Tetris of trying to figure out how to read all the books I want to read. <laughs> so so I was going through all my lists, all my TBRs. I have multiple TBRs, and looking at all the books and figuring out how I can Tetris them all in. And uh, so there was some some passionate and excited organizing of books and I don't feel a lot of the the negative weight that I think a lot of people on booktube feel about that like for me it's I'm really excited about books and it's like I just want to get to all of them and I can't um and I know I can't so I'm I'm working on that part of it <laughs> the right now I do feel like I need to get to all of them I'm not going to so that's a little negative but it does mean I also realize I now this week have hit 100 books for the year, which is very unexpected. I was not trying for that at all. I thought there was no possible way I would wind up hitting the same number I did last year. I hit 180 and I don't have a target this year. So I'm not trying to get that many. This is just how much I've re read. So we're way up there. So it is actually very possible that I could read a similar amount this year without really trying. Last year I, I wasn't trying either and I just hit it. So. It's, it's wild to think that I have read that much this year. So reading has been very good. Um, I did start a, a new old game uh, and that was very good. I, I started playing Reseteer, an item shop, shop's tale. I'll put in some footage of it, I'm just random playing. It's a very low stress game. The, the premise kind of has stress to it because your father has died and you are supposed to be paying off his debt. He was not very responsible for money. Um, and he, he owned an item shop. So um, I think if you like stuff like Stardew Valley, this is probably the, the sort of thing. Um, you go into dungeons and you start very low level and kind of move your way up. And basically like there's two buttons and the arrow keys to move. And that's the, the complexity of it. So this is not like a super complicated game. Uh, so you go into dungeons and get collect items to sell and as you, you move up there's also other shops where you can buy kind of fundamental items, the very basics, and then there's also like a crafting shop where with the stuff you can buy and the stuff you can collect from the dungeons you can combine them into fancy items. And so you have to pay off your dad's debts over this um, kind of long time scale. So every so often you've got a calendar for when your debts are due and all that. Um, but I, I've played this before and I was just thinking about it the other day and was like, I would really like to, to play through that again. Um, one of the, the main things I really screwed up the first time I played it is that if you if you fail to pay your debts on time, if you don't have enough money, you, you lose, you lose and it starts over. I did not realize that when it was starting over, you keep your your skill progress. So so both your, your fighting stuff, you, you skill up at that and your merchant stuff of selling stuff. Um, you have to haggle with people and you get better at haggling basically when you're trying to sell stuff in your shop. And 
those skills you keep so it does actually get easier but because I was losing and it was starting over I kept deleting the game and <laughs> remaking a new save game so I was making it harder on myself than I need to so so now I have realized I can just do it very easily <laughs> this way if I just just don't keep deleting the game so anyway that has been ridiculously fun so um what else shows I finished up all of chef season two it's delightful as always wonderful wonderful show with home cooks um, being judged by Canadian famous chefs. And as soon as I finished, of course, Hulu recommended me Wall of Bakers, which I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so, so now I have to watch Wall of Bakers. Um, I know the new season of Glow Up has started. And so I'm very excited to get to that on Netflix. Um, what was uh, Indian matchmaking is another one. I, I really liked that show the first season. So there's a second season apparently now for that one too. That one is, is really interesting to see kind of the, the range because these are people all getting a traditional matchmaking. Uh, some of them are just looking for an arranged marriage. Some of them are looking for more of a love match. And it's really curious to see the, the broad diversity of what people are looking for within that framework. So yeah, um, I think I think that's it for my week. I don't think I have anything else to talk about. This is gonna be like an hour. I'm sorry, guys. My recommendations, very quickly. Uh, Crystal's Bookish Life, who is one of my favorite romance booktubers, did a really, really fantastic discussion, video essay on what is good prose. And it was interesting to hear that from someone who reads primarily genre romance. And I, I think it was true for any type of literature. Um, she stayed pretty well on, you know, things I know, talking about the different styles, but I really loved hearing her thoughts. She's, she's a great, um, thoughtful channel. Uh, the other one is Anaya Reads, who is a new booktube channel. And I just wanted to, A, just shout out that you should check out this brand new channel. Um, she only had, I think, 20 subscribers when I saw her second video. And her second video is a vlog reading unhinged women books and trying to understand this trend of unhinged women books. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was very well put together. So, so this is one of those like booktube channels that I think starts pretty fully formed and is like super on point with um, the editing and, and getting the message across of what they're trying to. So definitely check out that video for Anaya Reed's um, vlog on unhinged women. <laughs> it was it was great. So that is it for my week and way too much rambling about books. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone's having a good week. Thanks so much for watching. I don't see how that is comfortable, but that leg Gumbo. So weird. <laughs> so I finally went to the store and got a replacement for my dead hibiscus here. And I get home and go to dig it up and what is there but a little sprout <laughs> that I think is my hibiscus. So we're gonna have to find a new spot to plant my brand new hibiscus in case uh, this one comes back. So I thought this dahlia was definitely done um, and it sprouted three new buds that are coming up. And then my second dahlia here, I did not know this was going to be like five feet tall, but it's getting ready to bloom. And my mandavia are also blooming. So these guys are getting ready. I got some pink blossoms here. Ooh. I'm hoping these don't get too crushed by rain tonight. So cat grass is sterile, so you have to replant it every few months. And this is like the most happy, calming thing that after you water it, it gets these little drops of water that run all the way to the top. So 
I came out to water my plant. Wondering why it's looking so thin. <laughs> the squirrels very helpfully tried to bury something. <laughs> Every year they do this to my hanging plants. Ah. We are out walking and the deer are out again in the same yard as usual. So we've got a nice, nice rack. <laughs> Hoping I can get by because they were not too keen on me walking past. They're just going for a jog. <laughs> 